Hi, everybody. I hope you are taking care and doing well. I see a lot of folks trickling in. Um, I introduce myself all the time. And so today I'm going to keep it very, very short um, because we're in our final session um, of this really incredible um, knowledge equity series. And as the summer comes to a close, I think it's a fitting time, um, you know, just, just for folks that are um, maybe new here. I don't, I don't think a lot of new folks are joining today. Um, this session will really be a sort of more speculative and imaginative session. You know, we've been touching upon um, the legacies of slavery and anti-Blackness and research and education systems, thinking about imperialism and colonialism, thinking about settler colonialism and anti-Indigenous violence. And we've really been taking a kind of more um, specific, or we've been taking more specific route to think about how these systems of violence replicate um, in our current institution. So today we're taking a more imaginative approach and really thinking about how, um, yes, these injustices have duplicated onto what we do today, how we research and work today, um, but what do we do to kind of move against, move beyond them, kind of, you know, make strategies to deal with them. Um, so as I as I always say, I'm shaming to you um, with a, what color am I wearing? White and green shirt today. Um, my beige skin, my big hair is kind of contrasted with my mountain background painting that I always have. Um, I'm calling to you from Toronto, um, which is the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, um, as well as the many indigenous peoples and communities that have not been formally recognized by the Canadian settler state. And next week I'll be in Ottawa, which has its own um, uh, land lineages and legacies that I would like to think about some more. But um, we're here today with a really breadth of individuals. We have Jen, Fobazi, and Sophia. Um, their work is too complex for me to summarize, so I'm gonna pass it to them. We'll start with um, we'll start with Jen, then Fobazi, then Sophia, if you want to just do a little bit of an introduction to yourselves. Yes. Uh, good afternoon or morning or nights, wherever y'all are. Hi, I am Jen Brown. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm coming to you today wearing a very lime green shirt to give me a pop of energy because coffee's not cutting it today. <laughs> uh, I've got a big Afro um, medium brown skin and I'm in a home uh, with a bookshelf behind me and some light coming through. I'm also an undergraduate librarian um, and a speculative fiction author, and I am living in unceded Weichin territory, which is the ancestral and unceded lands of the Muwekma Ohlone peoples and the Lisjon Ohlone peoples. And um, I do a lot, I've written a lot, um, but I actually put a little thought and time into putting it together in a place that everybody can check out on my website, which is gencbrown.com. Um, the highlights are that I focus on critical race theory, critical pedagogies, and speculative fiction, and writing Black people into fantasy and science fiction settings that I wish I could have read growing up myself. Um, but that is me, and I'm so excited to be on this panel today. Oops, sorry, I muted myself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Fabazi Itar. Um, I guess I'm the vocational all lady, as someone <laughs> tweeted at me the other day. Um, and so, yes, my research um, primarily focuses on the concept of vocational all, which in short, is the idea that the mission, right? So whether it be libraries, education, social work, right? The mission behind it, the fact that they're usually considered public goods means that if you work in those fields, anything you do is also automatically a public good and how um, institutions use that to exploit their workers usually through underpay and overwork. Um, I have also um, done a lot of work as an EDIA consultant for organizations. And 
Um, finally, I have just started my PhD at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and so the campus is on the lands of the Peoria, um, the Illinois, obviously before it's what the campus, that's why we're called the Fighting Illini. Um, and thankfully we have just finally changed our mascot from a horrific <laughs> headdressed man and are still in the process of trying to figure out what our new mascot will be. Um, to read more about my work and my thoughts on libraries, education, and activism, you can um, look at my website, fabaziitar.com. And I'm also on Twitter primarily. So um, please feel free to, you know, tweet along. Um, my handle is at Bob Etar. So it's pretty easy, Fob, the first three letters of my first name and then my last name. Um, and that's it for me. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sophia Learn. My pronouns are she and hers. Um, I'm wearing a black t-shirt. I have light brown skin and a short bob, I guess you could call it, with black hair. Um, very straight, flat black hair. <laughs> um, I'm coming to you from uh, Somerville, also known as unceded ancestral Massachusetts and Wampanoag lands and the current home of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, in this panel, I'm sort of functioning in my role as a root editor, um, representing the other four editors, Meg Diabebe, Christina Santiago, Joyce Gabiola, and Jorge Lopez McKnight. Um, and outside of that, I I guess I still identify as a librarian. Um, and I'm a facilitator uh, and consultant in my other work. So happy to be here with all my friends. Thank you, Sophia and Fabazi and Jen. I think that um, we have a really unique session today because all three of our lovely panelists know each other, um, have done some speaking events together. So really consider this um, a very conversational session. So I encourage you to submit any questions, constructive feedback, comments in the Q&A function. Um, and as always, we'll incorporate them into the session itself. Um, today, we're gonna start off um, you know, with a little bit of caution that throughout these sessions, as I've said, um, I really gravitate towards the big, big questions and they demand sort of big, big answers. And really all of these sessions have animated from, um, you know, my own desires as, as the moderator of these sessions, you know, to, to ask these sorts of questions that I'm struggling with um, and find others who are also struggling with it um, and are trying to craft strategies and have examples and stories they can share um, that may be able to um, work within my own context. So we're going to start off today with um, Jen. And um, we were just talking right before this session about a good way to begin. Um, and I'll pass it to Jen. And the sort of question that I'd like to start us on is kind of strategies and examples of the ways that we can deal with the genealogies of injustice. So how do we um, deal with slavery, anti-Blackness, settler colonialism? How do we um, work within institutions that have been crafted and that have been birthed from these histories? And a big, big questions again. Um, and so we'll, we'll start there with Jen, if, if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, and I, so I appreciate several things about the framing of this question because I feel like it it really is a struggle. It's like it's there is not a clear answer to this. There are strategies, um, but it's something that I grapple with in my own research, but also just in like navigating librarianship um, every day, day to day, whether I'm it's a micro interaction with colleagues or a macro space of doing 
institutional work, which oftentimes because I am a librarian of color, it's very easy for me to end up on diversity committees and equity task forces and, and initiatives that unfortunately continue to replicate systems of harm and cause problems when it comes to acknowledging even just the emotional labor um, and the amount of energy that it takes um, to show up as someone who cares about this work on a personal level, but also is having that care then monetized and almost like mediated through the lens of institution, through its documents, through its policies, through its public facing materials. I've written, um, co-authored actually, I think with folks even on this panel about the ways that the institution is documenting and using our bodies as a, as a way to document its sort of performative work in these spaces. Um, so even when we talk about how to how do we recognize these institutions, legacies and genealogies of slavery and anti-Blackness and settler colonialism and imperialism, even the ways we've come to try and recognize those, um, whether it be diversity committees or uh, certain projects and programs. And I'm speaking very much from an academic context, right? Because this is a question that could also be asked and answered society-wide or outside of academia, and it should be. Um, but within the academic space, I think about how a lot of our current answers are just so lacking. Um, and a lot of it feels a little bit like um, we, we contrast against the larger societal issues of burying and rejecting knowledge and um, banning and hiding whatever does not sit with us, whatever does not sit with our worldview, whatever that may be. Um, it's a lot easier to pretend and to say, we're going to teach this curriculum that completely is devoid of critical race theory or legacies of oppression because we don't want people to feel bad and guilty, which then equates this idea of reckoning with our past as something that is supposedly hurting the, those in the present, when actually it's it's hurting many of people by not recognizing it. Um, so it it feels very... This work feels like there is so much work to be done. And if I'm sort of veering off in different directions, I think that's also representative of how I feel that the work has to happen because there is no one big capital L library. We are all dispersed. We are all on different lands with different legacies of oppression. Um, California, where I'm at, has a very different legacy with Latinx populations than maybe other places. It also has different legacies of anti-Blackness than, say, the South's anti-Blackness. And so reckoning with that here in our institutions is different than the reckoning that may need to happen in Georgia or in Louisiana or some other place. So I guess part of me is like being able to say that it's okay to sit with the mess and also to to co-locate where we are in time and space in our institutions. We're never just at our home library. We are at an institution that is on unceded land, that is in a state with its own histories of uh, subjugation and, and supremacy that are different than the national subjugation and supremacies that have taken place and not feeling the need to boil it down to, let's just make a diversity committee and think that that will fix all of our problems or think that that will address the library and campuses hundreds of years worth of these legacies because it won't. Um, I don't, I may not know exactly what that reckoning looks like, but I know it is not, it is not conducive to the current systems that we have created to try to address it. We're failing in that respect. I want to just, it feels odd because I want to ask more questions, um, but I also want to see if there are any responses, Sophia, Fobazi, um, what you folks are thinking about this. I think this, this conversation about strategies, it's like there are so many things that could be done. There are so many things that are being done. Um, what's not enough? What can be done in my context? That sort of thing. And so um, I'm cognizant that even asking about strategies assumes that there are some strategies that are better than others, um, some strategies that are, you know, can be used in every single context, which is impossible. Um, so if there are specific examples folks want to share, then by all means.
Okay. Um, so I think that, you know, Jennifer has definitely touched on a lot of the things that, you know, I would say. I think that one of the most important things to think about in any project that we do, you know, not it just related to EDIA, um, but, you know, any activism, any goal that we're trying to set is think about scope, right? Um, we are only one person, one, you know, group, one library. And so we, our work is not going to, you know, be the thing that, you know, makes Joe Biden less of a wet noodle, you know, like, so it can be, and it can be really hard to remember that, honestly, you know, because we want to change the world, right? We want to at least do our part in moving the needle towards a more just and equitable world, a more just and equitable space. And so I think that, you know, thinking too broadly can really lead to burnout really quickly and not just burnout, but cynicism, right? The idea that nothing, <clears throat> nothing that we do is actually helpful, that everything is symbolic. Um, and so I think that a way to combat that is to try and think smaller, right? What can I do to, if not help the entire campus, help the student workers who are here in the library with me, or help the, the staff who, you know, are lower in the organizational chart and have less power to speak, right? And so by thinking in sort of more discrete terms, it can be one easier to actually accomplish and to build on that. Um, you know, one of my favorite pedagogical tools is scaffolding, right? The idea that you start with kind of the most basic principle and you gradually build on that principle to harder and more advanced um, topics or ideas. And so, you know, this might, I know that this seems like a little bit of a cop out in some activist spaces, but, you know, sometimes you do just need that symbolic EDIA committee because, I mean, let's really think about the history of libraries here, you know, like there are so many places that are still de facto segregated, like, let's be real, right? Um, it, you know, when we think about the history of segregation, right, most people talk about, you know, the uh, schools, they talk about the restaurants, you know, the lunch counters, things like that. But both public and academic libraries were segregated for the longest time. And not only that, but many libraries closed their doors rather than integrate. Or they, again, took out all the tables and chairs in the integrated room to, you know, persuade people to leave, right? And so we are dealing with centuries of oppression working against us. And again, when it comes, I feel like the two big things, right? Scope and the other thing is speed, right? We think about the civil rights movement and it seems like partly because of the way our textbooks have taught it to us, right? But it seems like it happened in like a couple of months, right? At most a year. But, you know, things like the Montgomery 
bus boycott lasted 380 something days. You know, it took a long time to get even the most basic rights that we have now and that, you know, are obviously being rolled back and it can be scary seeing these things rolled back and you just want to be like oh we have to fix this right now and you know just remembering that all things take time so you know yes you start with the you maybe you have to start with the symbolic stuff but you use that to open the door to more advanced stuff and you know hopefully to more substantive stuff and just remember that it may not happen in a week or a month or a year or even while you're still there you know but planting the seed is important as well Yeah, to build off of what both Jen and Kobazi have been saying, um, I think it's really important to remember, right, that our institutions were built to be exclusionary. Like none of us on this panel were meant to be in these institutions, especially. Um, and so knowing that, how does that then change your approach to your work? Right, I think like the question for me are a lot of the interventions, what are they meant to do? They're often meant to benefit the institution itself, right, to protect the institution, to make sure the institution will still be there tomorrow, 20 years, 100 years from now. And it doesn't care about you know, those of us who work there, those of us who will be gone from there. Um, and so knowing all those things, like what does that change about the work that you're going to do? Um, and you know, to speak a little bit to what Kobazi said earlier about you know, starting small, that there are probably already people, if not on your campus, but in the surrounding area who are doing important work. So how do you redirect your institution's resources to those places? Because for me, like already, you know, being on the campus, you're already excluding, you're displacing, you're um, all these things, right? You're colonizing the land. There's just like so many things that the institution is doing by being there in this place, in this time. So what can you do? What are you doing? What is your institution doing? Probably nothing. Um, that is actually benefiting the community that was going to live on this land, that lives on this land, that um, is going to be displaced from this land or is currently being displaced. Um, so to me, it's like reaching out to those folks and saying like, what are we gonna do for you? Um, because obviously institutions have a lot of power and resources. Um, and uh, a lot of like what I'm saying is heavily influenced by the work of like Robin D.G. Kelly, where he talks about in Black Study, Black Struggle, this redirecting of resources, um, and also Sandy Grande and refusing, refusing the university, right? A lot of Indigenous and Black scholars have been writing about this, doing this work. Again, there are people who have been doing this work for a really long time. Um, so to say like, I don't know what to do, to me is sort of like a lazy answer. I'll be like, how somebody tell me what to do, right? Maybe the onus is on you to figure out what other people are doing and how you can support them. Thank you all. I think, um, you know, there's one question that's come up in the Q&A that I really, I really want to come back to um, regarding committees, because I personally have I've seen a lot of tension come up um, in terms of diversity committees, you know, stuff like land acknowledgments as well um you know these symbolic gestures sometimes they're important sometimes they're needed as Fabazi said sometimes that symbolism is needed and it doesn't necessarily um obfuscate some more advanced and concrete work um but uh the the question that really came up in the chat was how do you encourage young professionals particularly you know diverse folks that would be populating these uh, diversity committees to contribute to change without placing this burden on them. And some tension that I've come across is this idea of identity politics and that only diverse um, folks should be on diversity committees. And then there's pushback to that, that no, there should also be um, privileged communities sitting on diversity and inclusion committees uh, because they should be taking some effort, you know, in redressing this exclusion in the first place. Um, and then 
push back to that, that how are institutions that are, you know, catering to this privilege, how are folks that have this privilege, you know, going to be, are they really ready to let it go? Um, that sort of thing. So I want to, I want to come back to Jen on this, because I think that this is a very um, concrete thing that many folks are dealing with regarding diversity committees. So um, what, how do we deal with this? Again, a big question. Do we continue to um, um, ask, particularly in academia, young, young marginalized communities to sit on these committees, expend this time and energy? Do we include other more privileged folk? Um, do we get rid of these committees altogether? Is this symbolism bad and not doing it bad is the wrong word is the symbolism not doing anything that sort of thing I know this is another big question but if you have any thoughts yeah uh it's a it's a it is a big question but I have kind of two thoughts one is this is specifically speaking to the marginalized and minoritized folks who are being asked to serve on these things um, if you can, if you are in a safe place and, and safe enough place where you can say no, it is okay to say no, the committee will exist without you, they will do their work without you, and you can always join another time that you do you are not the sole person responsible for carrying the burden, even though the institution will make you feel that way a lot. Um, Practicing saying no is, is really hard. It was hard for me. I said yes to a lot of things, especially earlier in my career that it taught me something. So I wouldn't say I regret it, but it's like now that I've come through the other side there, I just try to say no, no more often or draw boundaries wherever possible. Maybe you sit on it, but you don't have to chair it. You don't have to lead it. Cause I mean, that'll also be a thing. It's like, well, you can negotiate then how much of the labor you're willing to carry. Let the, let privileged people carry that labor but then allow yourself to sit on it and speak your truth and allow yourself to have multiple avenues where this work is being done. Just like Fawazi and Sophia were saying, there are other places in the institution that are doing work. So if you sit on your library ZEI committee and it is not moving in a direction that feels right, there's probably someone else on campus that is moving in alignment with your values or a group on campus that is moving in alignment or a group in your community. It might be completely off the campus. Um, what are people doing in your area and how can you get involved so that you feel like your work matters? And specifically, if you're feeling burnt out, don't be like, oh, I need to then go run and find something else. It's okay to serve and then be like, okay, that was, I'm done. Don't, don't ask me to sit on anything for another year or two. It is okay to say no, it is okay to rest. And while I don't think that, um, I wouldn't say that these committees could, should go away entirely, right? Like they have perpetuated a lot of harm, but there is certainly, as my wonderful co-hosts have said, there's value to them existing because we have to start somewhere. But also sometimes they, sometimes they fizzle. Sometimes they fizzle out and that's okay too. It's okay if the institution for maybe three or four or five years doesn't have that committee and then it gets rebirthed down the line because as we've talked about, these institutions protect themselves. They go on existing there will be new iterations down the line. And sometimes it's fine to me to let something that is maybe not as effective take, take a backseat or completely pause the work to come back later when people are either better resourced, better knowledge, or just ready to take on the work anew. Because we're also, all of this is always changing as well. This is not static work that we can just say we were doing this 10 years ago and this is what we need to continue to do. It's possible that that's the case, but we might also need to do something and approach something completely differently. Um, like our trans brothers and sisters have always been under attack, but they are especially um, in danger today. I would argue that, you know, a diversity committee a while ago might not have had that on their radar, but today I don't know how you can do that work without thinking about um, gender analyses and your sort of analyses of power on campus and who is able to even do things like use restrooms safely or who has a right to walk into a space without being immediately signaled out um, as a threat or something like that. So I just, I think we have to be mindful that the work is always changing. So it's okay if it stops. That's, this is a very loose answer that feels like I'm saying yes and to everything, but I think that's also how it has to be because as we've said, so much is contextually dependent. So 
It's okay if it stops. It's okay if it keeps going. It's okay if you say no. It's okay if you're passionate and you say yes. I think checking in with yourself and knowing yourself and having people in your corner who can bounce the truth off of you and be like, look, you always say yes to this. Maybe you need to say no. Like it, that matters. So having your groups and your people that you can trust and talk to has made a big difference for me because <laughs> I can't tell y'all how many times I've had to message someone and be like, should I say yes to this? And they're like, no, no, you don't need to say yes to this or you don't have to say yes to this. So having those, the people in your life that you care about, your communities, that, that can also change how you do this work and how you see yourself as a part of this work. What do y'all think? Sophia, Fabazi, how does this question, we kind of touched on it, but I'm like, I also want to know what you all have to say because I just, the big one. Fabazi, do you want to go first? I have, okay. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I want to speak like specifically to this question that says, how do you encourage young professionals to contribute to change without placing this burden on them? And my question is like, why are you encouraging young professionals to contribute to the change? Because if, you know, older professionals or professionals who have been in this for a longer time had not been doing this work before, um, now we have to clean up their messes, right? So to me, it's like, why aren't you encouraging the people who have been in this profession a long time to contribute to the change first? Then you can say, sure, why not invite the young folks to come on and do this work as well? Because you have to be the model. Um, I don't usually see too many models of this um, when I used to work in libraries of like folks who have been in the profession a long time who are you know, actually working to do this. Um, so for me, that is the wrong question to ask. The other element to this is like, I hear what Jen and Fobazi say about EDI committees. I think I'm on like maybe the more radical side of this where, you know, it depends on what the EDI committee is there to do. And if the EDI committee doesn't have power or it's just being used as like a scapegoat or, you know, just like ways in which it's being used as a tool of the institution, then to me, it's not worth having one. Then, you know, your work, your energy, your time, is better used elsewhere. Again, like looking off campus, right? I could honestly, <laughs> I don't really care about making the profession or the institution look good, right? That's not why I became a librarian. That's not what I'm interested in. And so for me, the question is, you know, to ask you yourself, what are you here to do? And who are you here to serve? And if your work is about serving the institution, because you think the institution is great, you know, again, with the vocational all that Fobazi was talking about, um, then maybe you're, you know, asking the wrong questions. You're honestly misplacing your time and energy. Um, I think, again, there's like so many other ways to approach this, to think outside of committee work. Um, I think one of the things that white supremacy does to us is like limit our imagination. So thinking that, oh, it has to fall within this like very well-structured thing because that's how the institution operates and we have to work exactly how the institution wants us to work, right? You really have to like ask yourself, why, why are these the answers that we're coming up with? Why are these the interventions that we're being um, asked to do? Um, some of the work that I would point to that has informed my thinking around this, for example, is um, the work of Roderick Ferguson and Ronaldo Walcott, who have really like helped me think about how EDI is being used as a tool of the institution. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I think that, you know, what we're seeing are, to go back to um, Jen's yes and, right? Um, white supremacy culture would have us think in either or thinking, right? You either do the committee or you do the community activism work. And I think that, you know, and again, in terms of what are your own strengths, you know, think about that as well. Like maybe you aren't super great at, you know, community outreach, but you're really good at 
Robert's rule of order, you know, not my bag, but you know, someone has to do it. <clears throat> and, or you're really good at policy um, work. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what your own skills are, what you can bring to these different fights is also important to think about, right? Um, I think that definitely in terms of modeling that the tenured and um, older professionals within the, or if not older professionals, but people who have been there longer or higher in the organizational chart should definitely be modeling um, for these initiatives that are happening in the library is on campus and it shouldn't fall primarily to the early career for sure. Um, I think that in addition, if you are planning on staying within libraries, right? Um, because then it is perhaps important to have some of these initiatives be based within the campus for your own tenure docket. You know, maybe it's, you know, it's neoliberal to say, but you also have to eat. You know, you also have to succeed in your own career, you know? Um, and that's also another choice that you can make, um, you know, regarding both Jen and Sophia's point, right? If, if you want to say yes to the things on campus, you know, do so, like um, make that, if that's, you know, your vision, your mission for yourself, that's totally cool. And if you are like, mm, I'd rather put this energy towards the community, that is also totally fine. You know, again, there's no this isn't an either or situation. It's literally just looking at your own skill sets, your own energy levels, your own experiences even, and thinking about where that, those skills, the, that energy that you have can best work with whichever you know, communities it might be. That's the thing that you really have to think about. Um, you know, during the, I know for myself, um, during the early pandemic with the George Floyd thing, it was really hard for me not to be out there marching, you know, not to be out there protesting um, because, you know, that was one of my main things that I used to do pre-pandemic. And you know, it made me have to shift my thinking, you know, think, um, shift my focus. It's like, okay, if I can't march, what can I do? You know, I can use the fact that I have a, a big voice to um, send people to mutual aid, you know, fundraisers and things like that. Um, and so, I, I want us to remember that, again, going back to the civil rights movement, there were so many different paths that people took in helping the movement forward, right? There were the lawyers who helped with the legal stuff. There were the people who just made sandwiches so that people could, you know, eat while they were on strike or while they were boycotting or whatever it might be. You know, there are so many different ways to contribute to this movement that, you know, there isn't any one right way. Um, and so, you know, finally, when it comes to the question of white people on committees or not committees, Honestly, that 
I would say it's really difficult because on the one hand, you know, white people be crazy. Um, sorry, you know, didn't mean to use crazy, but you know, um, but on the other hand, you know, all skin folk ain't kin folk either. So there's no real right or wrong answer in terms of having a multiracial EDI committee or just a people of color EDI committee. Um, it really just depends on who the people are, you know, who is truly there, as Sophia said, for the right reasons, you know, not necessarily just to be like, oh, I'm such a good ally kind of thing, but who actually do want to enact some change within the organization. And so, you know, just keeping that in mind whenever you're creating any sort of um, EDIA committee within the libraries. Well, Bobby, that was, I just want to build off of that for a second because yes, yes, and yes. And some of what you said made me think about how um, when folks make this binary between either on campus support or community support, they're also not even thinking about what that community support looks like and what is needed. It could be that all that's needed is for you to share the work that they're doing with your colleagues rather than taking this kind of colonialist mindset of I'm going to go into the community and, you know, do things. Well, do you know who the community is, especially since so many of us take jobs in places we've never lived uh, because of the way academia works? A lot of us have to just take a job where it is. So that means you may not have been born there. You may not have grown up there. You don't know, actually know that community. You can research, um, but ask yourself too, if you're thinking about it in this kind of either or way, why, what, what calls to you about community oriented justice work and why can't you offer that support without necessarily feeling like you have to be in the center of it? And I think so much of this thinking, so much of our work in this area would shift radically if we could just decenter ourselves for a minute. I feel like that's the main issue with a lot of our well-meaning white allies and also the skin folk that aren't kin folk is we aren't able to decenter our own selves. And um, you know, this this has come up in different places, but I love Adrienne Marie Brown's work on emergent strategy because so much of it is about seeing not you as the savior of a system, but you as a part of a system, a community, um, this fractal theory of like work that is done in the small context ripples and can affect the large. So like community-based activism and organizational work looks like, just like Bobazi said, so many different things. It does not necessarily mean march into a meeting place or space and try to take up unnecessary space. Like how can you decenter your own needs, your own past and history for just a minute? No one is saying that decenter it forever or that you don't have things going on or oppressions vectors of oppressions that you're experiencing. But if you care about the community, especially if you weren't from there, you have to step aside and you have to listen more than you talk or more than you take up space. So like, that's also something that like can be done at an individual level is decentering yourself, even in conversations with colleagues or in the community or in your own, you know, campus community. Because there's a lot of diversity community-wise on our campuses too, about different socioeconomic backgrounds, ability statuses. There's just, there's so many things we could all benefit from just learning to ask ourselves, like step in, step out, like almost like a, you know, for people who used to like double dutch, like how can you gracefully step in and step out when it's your time to, and give homage to the small parts of the work, not the big flashy things that get you a publication credit or something like that.
I was going to give it a second, but I really want to ask this question. Um, there was a question that came up in the Q&A, and I'm going to kind of repackage it, um, because the question is really focused on kind of the, the first steps that libraries can take to create a DEI committee or kind of fulfill these DEI pillars. Um, but I really want to come back to this sort of um, desires mindset. Um, Jan, Fobazi, and Sophia, you're all coming from library spaces, particularly academic library spaces. And something that we were talking about before in terms of what we wanted to touch on on this session, were these kind of um, goals and desires that we had for these spaces. And so um, again, another big question, but I think it's coming up in a lot of the questions that are coming up in the Q&A. Um, what are the sort of practices, the values, the features, the goals that you want centered, that you think are important to take first steps around? Um, and how do you imagine we'd be able to begin and enter into those desires? And Again, like I said, big, big questions. And so maybe we can start at Sophia. I don't know if there are some, some immediate thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, I think, well, some of the ways in which like I believe this should happen are happening through Uproot, um, a publication that's um, also supported by Spark through a, a grant that they've given us two years in a row. So thank you to Spark. Um, and, you know, our work there is all about paying attention to the things that traditional publishing and um, in libraries and elsewhere haven't really done. Um, some of the work that we're interested in doing is building community, right, building relationships between the contributors who are actually coming in to, you know, give their work to us, to who trust us and honor us with their um, creative creations um, and thinking about like, how do we build that bigger and broader with also like our peer reviewers um, that it's not just, oh, you know, I'm gonna drop off my work into this box. I don't know who's going to see it. I don't know who's gonna read it. I don't know who's giving me comments. I don't know anything about that person. I just like see the comments coming back with like no, cont no contextual um, information about the person, nothing about their positionality or their identities that's informing like how they're interacting with my work as the author, right? And so what we're trying to do that's different is specifically also centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color voices to say like, these are the voices that have been decentered in the past that have been erased um, and struck from the record, right? That the knowledge and experience coming from those communities are usually devalued, decentered, um, and invalidated by, you know, the white male voices in power. So thinking about how we can do this differently, how do we build relationality and care into the actual creation of the work, right? That it's not just about the work, it's also about the process, that we care about the people who are involved in the process. Um, something that one of my other colleagues, one of my co-editors, Christina Santiago has said in the past about peer review being as relationship, right? That it's, again, not a transactional, kind of thing that I'm just giving you this work, you're going to give me your comments back and that's it. And there's nothing more from that, right? Um, that what we're actually doing is building a small community within each work that gets created. Um, and hopefully those relationships can last and go beyond just the creation of the work that we end up publishing. And I'll just stop there, even though there's a lot more that could be said. Thanks, Sophia. Jen, Fabazi, any comments there? Or on other other features, other values? Um, I feel like the focus has really been on DI committees, but you know, I think like everyone was saying, you know, there is these sort of slow and symbolic work, and then there's this sort of fast, urgent work, and they're not necessarily binaries in that way, and they can be um, very much threaded together. But um, expanding a little bit from there, are there other things that you think are necessary that you want to see um, library systems do, knowledge systems do, universities do? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> You know, I think that, you know, we, we talk about EDI um, when it really should be EDIA, 
Um, and, you know, I, I've been pretty open about the fact that I had to sort of leave regular library work is because of the the focus on presenteeism, right? The fact that in order to be seen as effective, you literally have to be physically present all the time. And, you know, that was a struggle even before the pandemic. But then, you know, when that happened, you know, I, I always said that the irony was that for a while, my work was actually so much more productive because I was finally able to do work from home. Like I had been, you know, arguing for and advocating for at like basically every single institution I'd ever worked in. Um, and of course, when it finally affected you know, the able-bodied people, then it wasn't an issue of, oh, are you actually going to be able to do work or having, you know, supervisors literally say, like, you have to be like, oh, we'll let you work from home, but you have to be on Zoom from nine to five or, you know, basically not take a, a lunch break because just in case they can like drop in on you and you know as I saw the way that unfortunately COVID policy was going I just knew that I wouldn't be able to go back into a building where people would be unmasked not just like one or two people once or twice but like that would just be the norm. And I knew that eventually, as unfortunately it has happened, right? As many of you and my colleagues and everyone in the chat can probably attest to, right? Um, now that we're back to normal, we are all back in these spaces with, you know, brutalist designs with absolutely no air, like, HEPA air filter filtration, no open windows, you know, again, most of our libraries were built again back in the 70s in during the brutalism movement. So it, they're just giant concrete boxes that trap air inside. Like that's literally what they are. And so it's in terms of like some things that are urgent, you know, in addition to of course, our trans brothers and sisters who are really suffering, it, the disabled community has basically been silenced by, at all levels, you know, all the way to the White House, you know, again, Joe Biden saying like, oh, congrats on us moving past COVID, like, again, thousands aren't dying every day still from COVID and you know now monkeypox like we're just having more and more variants more and more um pandemics and we've all well we've all in power not you know I don't want to generalize too much but many people in power have just decided that it's worth losing, you know, those people day after day, week after week, as long as they can pretend, you know, usually in their nice air conditioned offices away from everyone else, that COVID is in fact over and we can all move on. And so, I think that it's important to really think about who is actually there, who can actually be there to talk about these issues that we're hoping to fix. 
you know, so many of us cannot be in these spaces anymore just because of the lack of care to have us there. Yeah, there's so much to be said after that, that I'm not sure where to, where to go. Um, I am mindful of time. We have three, three minutes left for this session. Um, and like all the other sessions, I'd really love to end it off with resources. Um, I know folks have been sharing as they've been talking. Um, and Jen, I'm cognizant that you didn't really get some time to touch on that, that last sort of question. So if you want to add anything, please, please feel free. Um, but so maybe we'll start with Jen, if there are any resources you want to share for those who are listening in um, that you haven't shared already. Yeah, um, I will just say like so much yes to what both Fabazi and Sophia said. I feel like this work, features of it need to be completely liberated from the expectations that have come before decades before where we are today. Um, the, the main resources I'll share, because these are things that, I'm, that are holding me lately, um, I'll put them in our panelist chat and then they can maybe be shared broader, but um, Jaina Brown's Black Utopias is still a book I feel like has held me so much and it moves through Black speculative thought in a way that I feel there are a lot of lessons that could be applied to the way that we're moving through time and space right now. Octavia Butler continues to be um, just a visionary and a guide that I, I keep holding close and her parable books in particular are ones I, I go back to. And then just Rest for Resistance, which is a, a zine and organization that is um, queer and trans led that focuses on talking about all of these things, including um, just the ways that burnout and um, COVID continue to exacerbate everything. Um, but I find their writing another thing that's holding me. So I hope these are resources that folks can lean into um, they're not all scholarly, but I also read a lot of stuff that isn't scholarly, and I think that's also a part of the knowledge production conversation is how we value all outputs um, from all sort of areas of our experience in life. Thanks, Jen. Sophia, and then maybe for Bozzi, if you just want to share a few resources. Sure, yeah. I did mention a few already that I think everyone um should read and then also I'm gonna ask Nick if he could share these two links one of two is which for Uproot which I've mentioned before um, and also want to make note of an upcoming collaboration that's going to be published soon that we did with community study which I'm also a part of which is a series of study groups um, for black indigenous and people of color where we read on a specific topic or an author and the most well, not the current one, but the most recent one that we just did was of Bell Hooks, where we read a range of her work. And there were some folks who felt um, called to write something, uh, having done that study with us. So we're going to publish that soon. So that's exciting. Um, so I put the links for both Uproot and Community Study. So if you want to see what the syllabus is for our current study, which is Indigenous Lifeways and Liberation, or the previous ones that we've done, there's a lot of reading there. Um, and then, of course, Uproot has a ton of great um, features that you should definitely check out. Thanks, Sophia. Fobazi, feel free. Yes. Um, so I'm putting, I'll put some links in the chat. Um, so one of the things that I've been really um, trying to take to heart is this idea of rest and um, understanding, you know, again, that the Audre Lorde quote that self-preservation is a radical act and I think that, again, with so much that's happening everywhere, it can be hard not to want to keep doing things because it seems like things just get worse day after day. 
And so um, the NAP ministry, it's not necessarily um, academic, but as Jen said, right, um, there's a lot of experience and knowledge outside of the ivory tower um, that I really try and take to heart what she says and what some of the strategies there from just decompressing and letting go. Um, and I think that, you know, I always, not to, you know, plug my own stuff, but I do have a, a game about microaggressions and I do do like um, workplace training and stuff around the game. You know, you can play it by yourself or you can have your organization um, invite me to sort of go through how microaggressions affects us all. Um, you know, it may be sort of an older uh, concept in EDI, but I think that it still does sometimes the most harm within organizations specifically. And so, you know, just knowing how to deal with them and what are some of the ways that you can sort of turn it back onto the other person, I think is still really helpful. Um, uh, most, I'm sure most of you by now have read the vocational all article, but um, if not, that's definitely something that everyone should read. Uh, I think those are sort of the the main things for me in terms of resources. Thanks, Mabazi and Sophia and Jen as well. Um, it feels weird ending this. I'm not sure the best way to end this session and this series as whole. Um, but I think the shift has been to think about um, our own context and our own desires. So I hope you're doing this imagination, this speculation into what things you want to see in the academy, beyond the academy, in your lives, etc. And so thank you, Jan Fabazi and Sophia, for this really, really lovely session. Um, and thank you all the participants who have been, you know, coming so far. And I hope you have a good day, week, year ahead. Take care, everyone. Thanks, y'all.